Hey, welcome back to the Azure Enablement Show, the Armchair Architects. Um, we've talked a bit on this show in the past about how applications have changed, but what's that doing to data and how we're dealing with it? Join us. Hey, Uli. Hey, Eric. So we have talked in the past about how apps are changing, right? We had several several episodes in which you talked about how applications are changing and workloads are changing. But one of the things that I thought might be interesting to explore today is, okay, I'm guessing if the apps are changing, the chances are the data that is going on in the vicinity of those apps is also changing. So um, let's let's get into that. I mean, we talked we talked a little bit about how apps were changing for various reasons. They were changing because they were like embedded in a Teams client. They were changing. Um, gosh, I, there there were so many there's so many ways. So what does that do to the data around them? I mean, like I gotta guess that there's got to have some impact there, or maybe the two push each other simultaneously. Um, anyone want to want to start off with that? Yeah, let me see if I can, um, you know, give you a, the, the perspective on the way I think about this. You're right. Uh, data is changing based on the way that people are using apps. And the, from the customers I chat with and the people I chat with across multiple verticals, they're very interested to understand what's happening right now. And the reason why they're interested to understand what's happening right now is that because they need to either drive their answer questions and gain insights from the data or they need to drive actions associated with the data. If I have an oven that's in an industrial customer's manufacturing plant and it's trending in the wrong direction in terms of temperature, I need to act right now in order to relieve that issue so that I don't have downtime, which is costly. So that's an example of an action. An insight is, well, why did that happen? How often has it happened and is it part of a larger trend? And I think what's happening with these questions that our customers and, and people in the real world have is they're continually driving us more towards to, real, to realize that data is just a stream. Uh, we used to live in a batch world in which you just, you would co collect transactions, do some enrichment, copy them someplace, and then you try to derive insights from that. Still works and still valid today, but the way that I think that the world is trending is that that is a, an example of a very cold stream of data. It's, it's might, it occurs more infrequently, it's larger in its chunkiness and in its size, but more and more, we're actually seeing insights and actions need to be driven from hot data or data at warmer temperatures, which is I'm getting messages. Those messages are being enriched. They're transforming from telemetry into events. Those events mean things. And now I have an entire ecosystem of apps that rely on data that are event driven. Well, again, I think you're, you're introducing a couple of terms that we might want to talk a little bit about. So when you introduce the word cold data, that means you effectively put the data that you where, however it got generated, you put it on storage. And then at some point in time, uh, you query the storage using a database or NoSQL system, whatever it might be. And then it goes and goes shows up in your application. And the closer you get to the point of origin of the data, where the data got generated in Eric's example, uh, the oven in the manufacturing plant, the hotter the data gets because it comes right off the system and you want to be able to react to it very quickly. And I think that's, I think the other dimension that Eric kind of folded into his conversation, which is uh, we used to be able to work on data fairly late. Now what we want to do is work on the data very early. Um, and that analytics, which used to be a po post processing thing. So all things already happened. Then we analyze what happened and we potentially do something about that has been shifting closer and closer to the point of origin where you want to drive analytics right then and there to make decisions to potentially go and uh, drive different behaviors, whatever that might mean in the specific context. And I think that's a really big shift. Uh, the other, the only caution I always say when I hear people talk about these things is don't confuse real time with synchronous processing. Uh, really introduce, keep introducing asynchronous processing, real enough time thinking um, so that you can uh, not get into this point where you have tightly coupled systems because you think you need uh, synchronous behavior equals real time, uh, which it doesn't. And so from an architecture perspective, be aware of that little trap. Uh, because that can get you into real trouble uh, from a systems architecture perspective as well as from the systems update perspective. But from the data perspective, Eric's points are spot on. 
again, I would love, I would change it to analytics is moving to the point of origin and analytics is becoming a key part of the business application or the transaction rather than what we used to do, which is we just record, stay, uh, save the record. That's why these things are called systems of record. Right. Uh, and then we have an inside application or an analytics class which runs batches and then says, oh my God, if we would have gone left instead of right, that would have been so much smarter. And now what we're doing is saying, let's go and bring intelligence closer to the point of origin, determine if we should go left and right based upon know-how and pattern experience, and then drive the workflow left or right, depending on what the right decision is. Okay, so I, so I get that the, the difference between hot and cold is sort of currency in some ways, right? It, it's, it's sort of how, how, how proximate in time is what was what's going on. But yeah. I guess you get into this interesting situation where it means that the window of data that you're actually looking at is smaller, right? Like when we yes. stick it on disk, we could be like, run it over the entire data set. So I guess my question is, is the way is the reason we're able to do that right? Instead of just assuming every decision is a shallow decision, um, is sort of the machine learning aspect of things the thing that hedges us against every decision being a shallow decision because there's only a no. small amount of data window no. that you're looking at. I would not look at it that way. First of all, before we go down there, uh, let's go step back a little bit and talk about the structural changes. What's happening? Okay. Um, again, if you look at the past where I grew up. Um, you effectively had pretty much only systems of record and you actually had uh, primarily relational databases. I grew up with relational database being the answer to whatever the data question was. Right. Yes, there were files, but in general, it was relational databases. Um, and over the last 15 years, you saw the rise of NoSQL databases, which effectively uh, deal with uh, less structured data. There's still structure in the data, but it's far less structure. Schema-less is a big term that has right. coming, come along and those kind of things. So I think that's a big shift in data. But the bigger shift is that analytics is taking over more space in the data environment than it used to. Uh, because of what you just talked about, which is or what we talked about, which is the decision making and stuff like that. And if you're looking at traditional business applications, I would have said in the 90s, 80% of what they were worried about, 90%, was transactions, systems of record work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And 20 to 10%, uh, you effectively were doing uh, reports. That was really it. Now, if you look at uh, what's going on is, uh, and the Dynamics team has done a great job uh, articulating this, is that we are living now in a data rich world and we want to use that data to drive a new category of applications. We call them insights applications. Eric mentioned that term already. Uh, so other people call it systems of intelligence. It depends on where you come from, of how what you call it. But you're now seeing 80% of the work happening in the analytics space and quote unquote only 20% of the work are happening in the systems of record. Because now you want to use all this data to determine right. patterns, repeatability. So that's step one for me. The changes in the data world uh, from relational as the only answer, mixing relational now with non-relational, no SQL and those kind of things. And then this really big shift from systems of record to systems of intelligence being the big thing that people are worried about. And then when you're looking at the, uh, the timeliness and you're now answering your question, the thing is a funnel at the end of the day. And what happens is at the beginning of the funnel is the hot data. So it right. just got generated. Right. And yes, we're using machine learning model, but we don't have to necessarily. It can also be a piece of code uh, that actually makes a very localized decision that says, okay, the oven, <clears throat> to use Eric's example, um, generated data ABC. Right. So there are three signals. Based upon these three signals and my past knowledge, I now make a decision um, based upon what I'm seeing. If I now introduce advanced uh, machine learning concept like reinforced learning and so forth, I get a better result because the three signals over time, uh, I will know which one is more important than the other, or maybe the composition is more important, whatever it might be. Um, and so it's really a very localized decision. And the further out you go into that funnel, the more information you gather, and therefore the decision surface gets bigger, but it also gets slower. <clears throat> because that's the way it works. And if you're looking at 
modern analytics platforms, they actually go from stream analytics, so in-stream analytics, like Eric talked about, to what I call a streaming database analytics, where the data does get terminated, but stays in memory. Mm-hmm. And you can, but you can now start queries because when you look at the stream, um, it's a great example. So behind me is a street. Um, a stream analytics is actually a way to think about, I'm standing in the stream and I go look at the cars come by and count how many red cars show up in a period of time. And so that's a stream analytics. So I'd really just look at it. And when they are gone, I have no memory where they're going, what they're doing. No, don't know. I just see them at this point in time and count or do something like that. Right. A, if you go into a streaming database, what happens, the cars get uh, d- uh, directed to a parking lot. Uh, in this case, it's a hot parking lot, <clears throat> meaning it's in memory. And a great uh, database that does this is uh, Azure Data Explorer that ultimately is a streaming database um, because right. you stream the data in, it gets terminated, but it stays in memory and you can start doing queries on top. Why do people want to do this? Because you want to compose it with other data. You want to have intelligence query. Instead of just looking at a point in the street, you're now looking at across the parking lot and see what happened. <clears throat> but you still do it in memory. Um, and then you persist the data. Um, and then you run, um, for example, a Spark um, analytics job over it to really go deep. And so not only go and go look at this parking lot that I created, I'm also looking at past par- parking lots and other data that I'm bringing in. <clears throat> and then you might end up uh, putting some of that data into a data warehouse because you want structured reporting, um, KPIs, whatever business analytics uh, models you want. So from our perspective or the way I think about it is you have this hot data, very localized, then you increase the scope and the capabilities of the analytics, and then you go deep, but takes longer, uh, big data and so forth, and then you might end up in reporting. And all of that um, has then various outputs, business analytics being one, reports, those kind of things. But right. as you already pointed out, David, analytics models using AI, <clears throat> where the big data system says, actually, the pattern we were promoting turned out to be wrong. And if you're not using uh, reinforced learning, which ultimately has a little bit of change flexibility based upon its reward system, right. uh, then you have to de- redeploy a new model uh, if you learn something new and so forth. So I think that's really the big change in data, um, this focus now on analytics rather than, quote, unquote, just record keeping. Yeah, there's a couple of things I'd love to, to kind of pr- sprinkle into that um, really good historical um, overview of wh- where, where we were and where we are now. I also grew up in the, uh, the, the Ralph Kimball days of star schema relational databases and ETL and, and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's amazing where we are now. The, the questions that some of our viewers might be asking are, well, what, well, how do I know when to do a stream analytical on hot temperature versus a colder temperature? And I think that if you're trying to answer questions like what just happened, what is happening, what's about to happen, and what should I do, those, those span the gamut from real-time analytics to prescriptive analytics in real-time, close to the edge, close to where the data is being generated. And in certain scenarios for our certain customers in certain verticals, those, the, having that there matters. What the underpinning is, David, going back to your question is, well, how do I actually you know, if it's hot, I don't actually have a whole bunch of reference data to be able to apply to make inferences to understand what's happening. So what do I do? So the question then becomes like, well, there are certain things we can do. We can utilize, we don't necessarily have to always utilize AI, but can. So AI can do probabilistic inferencing to say, hey, I don't have hard and fast rules about this trend, but over the last 30 minutes, I've seen things going in the wrong direction. And I don't think that that's the way things should go. Let me tell a human being about that or somebody about that. The other approach is just hard thresholds. The temperature for this particular oven should never reach above 40. And now it is above 40. Let me go tell human beings that something bad is about to happen. So there's different types of uh, inferencing at the hotter end that you can actually use to drive those actions. And then conversely, there's also this concept that's growing now called ephemeral storage, in which we take some of that, for example, time series data, and we persist it in the edge analytical platform. And we can do things like look at the past hour or the past shift, compare shifts together. And then through some policy or whatever, that stuff gets slid off, ideally to the cloud, 
where we can do that longer retrospective historical analytics that Louis was talking about as well. Um, so the other trick that we probably need to do is to help contextualize the information coming from the edge. Some of these assets and these messages coming from these assets are important. They contain important information, but it's not enough information. So if an oven is having a problem, I don't, I need more information about where that oven is, uh, what plant it's at, where it is in physical space, what it's part of manufacturing so that I can actually go, you know, gain some insights, do something else about it, or even, even send people to remediate that oven. Without that, I only know that it's, it's experiencing problems. So we end up having a world in which we can take some of that historical information, package it up, move it closer to where the data is being generated and utilize it in a data fusion uh, process to contextualize telemetry coming from these devices to transform those telemetries into events. Yeah, we had talked about uh, you know semantics and applying context to data in a previous episode, so I'd, I'd suggest people go check that out. Um, we can get really deep into this, but I want to make sure that we uh, I, that let's let's just close this one off here um, because I think we've said some really good stuff about how how data change. I suspect we can go on for a number of episodes about this because there's there's a number of dimensions. But I think what I want to do is uh, thank you, Uli, thank you, Eric, and thank you, everybody, for watching this. And uh, I hope you'll join us on another episode of the Azure Enablement Show. Mm -hmm.